Well, good morning, Bex Church. We got to really work on that, don't we? Good morning, Bex Church. <laughs> good morning, yes. And we welcome those who are viewing online as well. We're glad you're joining us today also. We have many announcements today, and if you'll notice up front, the flowers are given in honor of, um, uh, for, well, given to, by Terry, David, and Carl in honor of their mom and wife. We have many things happening this next week. On Tuesday will be our Pack, Eat, and Pray at five, starting at 5 o'clock, and also they'll be doing the shoe boxes, the Christmas shoe boxes at that time also on the Operation Christmas Child. And uh, we have an, a fall festival coming up next uh, Saturday, and we have somebody to make an announcement on that. Uh, we're, there she is. <clears throat> yep. Good morning. Um, I know Suzanne sent an email out this week. Um, the bulletin has had the sign up for a few weeks for Fall Festival, and um, as of this past Monday or Tuesday, I only had one person signed up to run a game. I had lots of help with donating cake squares and serving food, but I was really hoping to get some more volunteers to run games. Um, last year, I think we had between like 10 and 14 or so games and it was a lot of fun um, so if there's any way that you can run a game um, the choices are either you can bring your own game and set it up and run it or I can provide a game I just need since it's next weekend I just need to know ahead go ahead and know um, how many more games I need to get ready um, but if you would be willing to do that if you would come and see me after church or if you don't if you're online watching, if you'll email Suzanne. Um, but we just really need some more volunteers to run some games. Um, we really don't want to cancel it just because it is such a good outreach um, opportunity with the community. And we have a lot of people who um, are used to coming to Bex to do some type of celebration with us in the fall. Um, but if you are signed up for something already and you'd be willing to add on running a game or if you haven't signed up for anything if you would just come see me or talk to Suzanne that would be great thank you thank you I thought she was going to make an announcement no, too I, I did too. <laughs> Rick you have something good morning I just wanted to kind of inform you let you know um, many of you have noticed the windows in the downtown or down downstairs portion of the uh, the sanctuary the basement area over the years the windows especially on this side have deteriorated the wood is, there's a lot of rot there's a lot of uh, falling away of the material and all too but just to let you know the consistory has been looking at it for some time now the good news is Windows have been ordered, replacement windows and all of the replacement windows are for the downstairs area. They are in the manufacturing process right now. Our trustees are working with manufacturer and we have dates that are upcoming. Uh, we have been given some dates tentatively when uh, the windows will be complete and when they will be installed, but being that those Dates have not been confirmed. I'm not going to share them with you. I'm not going to take that chance. But uh, we, do, we do have w replacement windows that are coming. So just to let you know that we're moving forward with addressing some of the issues with the church facilities that we need to address. So uh, anyway, just uh, to let you know that. Yes, I think, Rick, aren't they going to be doing the sanctuary windows on Sunday morning between 10.30 and 11 and when they're going to do them? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Nobody <laughs> believe that. <laughs> and another thing. Um, I don't know if you've noticed in publications or on Internet, whatever. October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, we are blessed to have a pastor that has been with us for going on a short seven. time now yeah. but uh seven months going on seven yeah, months going on, on <laughs> Very seven short. months but most of us will remember what it's like to 
um, struggle without a senior pastor to do what God is calling us without the leadership of a senior pastor. And about four months, five months before we ever heard the name of Pastor Roland Slater, Pastor Slater was already looking at our church. Now, I'm not, go I'm not gonna say that Pastor Roland had that much foresight. I just, I mentioned that to say that it's a godly thing mm -hmm. that Pastor Slater had heard about Beck's church. Even months before we ever heard his name, he was already looking, evaluating, and we were fortunate that on May 1st of this year, Pastor Slater became our full-time pastor. Uh, I thank him for his friendship, for his witness, for his guidance, for his leadership, for his message, for his genuineness, all of those things. But in recognition of Pastor Roland's service to us thus far. <laughs> Roland, thank you so well, much. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do I open it? <laughs> thank you. It's not going to blow up my face, is it's it? Not going to, no, it, it, it's ticking. The, the other thing that I would mention is it's a, it's a token of our appreciation. When you get a chance, ask Pastor Roland what was in the box. <laughs> I'm kind of scared now. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been a blessing to be here. It's so exciting. And we, we have many more days and weeks and months and years uh, to work together in ministry. And so now we're going to take the opportunity to sing our first hymn. Let's all stand together and sing hymn number 435, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Good morning, good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A couple of things I uh, just want to share with you this morning. Uh, well, I, I guess I can say this since Kathy said something to me this morning. and uh, This would have been my 68th wedding anniversary today. For those of you who knew my beloved Mary. Uh, so, if I get a little touchy today, or as I'm standing here, it's my, my heart is not heavy, but joyful. And I think from last week, from the fundraising that we did, and from the craft fair, and I know that some of you have a little bit of humor, so you might appreciate a little humor from one of your own, not from me, but from a couple of other people. Because when we got together to do the pie baking, and uh, since Pam came in with uh, Joanne not able to make it, Pam, the daughter, came in and taught us how to make those pies that we sold all, what was it, 300? 150. 150. Well, I just doubled the value. <laughs> so we, we, we sold those 150 quickly, but the fun part was... <clears throat> As we are there, early in the morning, Herbert hadn't come yet. He, he was working. He came, he came later. I don't know how many, how many of us were there, 16, 18? 16 or 18 of us there. And uh, Sharon has finished her conversation. She says, are there any questions? Well, one of your delightful young ladies in the choir I see you looking away, Sandra. <laughs> so, Sharon said, are there any questions? And Sandra says, yeah, I have one. What's the question? How did this rooster get in the hen house? <laughs> I've, I'm like, <laughs> that was funny. I, it, 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 it stuck with me. I've shared that with some folks. Uh, <laughs> uh, something I want to I want to share with you. If you get an opportunity to look at the Museum of the Bible for a short period of time, has something remarkable. And any of you that that use YouTube for anything, I use YouTube for a lot of reference things. Uh, a few days ago, I started to study the Book of Judges. Day before yesterday, Michael, you will appreciate this. Uh, for those of you that like God winks, or if you know what God winks are, I know some of you do. So I started studying judges. And this past Thursday, I studied chapter 5 of Judges about Deborah and Barak and the song of Deborah and all that took place. Well, in chapter 5 of Judges, it mentions Medigo. That very night, I was on CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, which they have also a YouTube channel. And lo and behold, that word, when they go come up again, the ghetto, I'm sorry, where they have an over 1,800-year-old mosaic from a ghetto that mentions... Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how many of you get hit by that. But you want to see something powerful over 1,800 years ago? The revelations that continue to come, both in prophecies that are being fulfilled, that have been fulfilled, that we know about, but the archaeological finds of Jesus Christ are just phenomenal. Not that we rely on that faith our faith is in Christ alone, not in the archaeological finds. But how powerful is it that, as I even shared this with my daughter, and I sent her an email up in Iowa last night, and I hope she appreciates what I sent to her because she's not a Christian. She's been a New Ager for 40 years, which is heartbreaking, but I can't do anything about it. But go to CBN 
and look at that brief video of of this. It's so it's just beautiful. It's just it's just it's amazing. And you go, wow, eight, over 1,800 years ago. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, before we get into prayer, uh, there is one thing that I want to share with you as a congregation. And because we sang a song about prayer, and because it's about this body, this church, if you look around, you'll see a lot of us old people. Some of us are very old. And you'll see that the pews are getting fewer and fewer filled. We're an older congregation. And here's, here's my request for you and for something for you to give thought about, because I think about this a lot, and I'm sure there is others. What do we do that this church will be here in 10 or 15 years from now? And you may be thinking, well, I, I, what do you mean? We need to find a way, is that in our church leadership, and you as a part of it, what can we do to reach out to grow this community and this body? Not going out and stealing from other churches, but for those who are in other churches that are really looking for hearing the word, we know there's a lot of pastors out that, that aren't teaching the word. We need to be praying and trying to figure out and trying to give help to this church body. What can we do to grow the church? How can we bring in new believers? How can we get to those who are moving into the community? What can we do that we can sustain this church in the future? Because folks, I'm telling you, in eight to 10 years from now, I doubtfully, I will be living. And there's a lot of us, again, that are sick and departed. What can you do? You can pray diligently and pray with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Pray for it. How can we as a congregation, we as members of this body that's been here for all the years, what can we do? Something. We need to discuss it. You need to talk about it among yourselves. We need to give input to the church leadership. How can we help build the church? It's not going to happen overnight. We don't have very many youth here anymore. We don't have a youth leader. If we had a youth leader, what would they do? They'd have to go out and start from scratch and develop it. So I'm just, uh, I just appeal to you and your love for the Lord and your love for this church. Let's figure out a way together. Maybe we could even have meetings and just kick out some ideas. But there's got to be things. We've got a lot of real estate here. We've got a beautiful building setting down here that could be used for different functions. Um, so give thought to that. Uh, let me, uh, uh, as we go into prayer, uh, there's nobody really on the prayer list over here uh, other than what's on in the church bulletin. I did uh, share with you, if you don't know, uh, Joanne came home on Wednesday, uh, and she is going to take a number of weeks to heal, so doubtfully we will be seeing Donald and, and Joanne here, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, so let's go to the Lord now, and uh, you do your own prayer for a few moments, and then, and then we'll do a kind of a corporate prayer. Father God, as we come to you as a, as a congregation, as people with a heart for you, we recognize the era and the times in which we live, the times that are difficult, the times that are challenging. We are fighting evil all day long, and the only way for good to prevail is, or the only way for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. So Lord, give us guidance and direction what we can do in the world of evil that can bring about salvation to those that are seeking you. Uh, for those that are ill, Lord, we have a lot of folks in this church that, that are ill and hurting, and you give us different scriptures that we can rely on. Uh, for many are the afflictions of the righteous, and blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions. And God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. But mostly, Lord, we just come to you and, and we pray for this congregation. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for this country, Lord, that we as Christians and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are truly a minority. And 
we are criticized, condemned, we are looked upon as scum of the earth in so many different ways and throughout the world, Lord, uh, Christians are still coming to you and new believers are coming to you. The missionaries and throughout the world are sacrificing that uh, life that you have given them to be your servants and we just pray for them as well. Lord, guide us, lead us, and bless us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And now let us bring our tithes and offerings. now give thanks to the Lord. Father God, may these offerings be blessed by you, that the ability to just to reach out, Lord, and just to be your servant, uh, to do the great commandment, to teach those who are in need of hope, who are in need of purpose in life, who are seeking joy and hope that they don't have. And most important, Lord, that we can reach out to those to give them peace to know that when the end of their time comes that they will live in glory. Bless those who have given tithes on these offerings. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning. We're so glad you're here with us, and we're continuing this series on relationships. And since we're talking about relationships, I thought it would be a good idea that we stand up and say good morning to someone around you and, and say something encouraging, like, it's good to see you here. I think you have more hair than you had last week, something like that, you know? <clears throat> but stand up and greet each other and say something encouraging. <clears throat> <coughs> Morning. Make your way back. <coughs> Come. <laughs> Well, if you would, make your way back to your seat. You all act like you're related or something. <laughs> Might as well just have a family reunion. <laughs> make your way back to your seat. Sharon reminded me to mention that to make sure you pick up a box today and then you put a frog ring into the box, and then when you're getting finished with it, put $10 in there for the shipping and everything. So make sure you pick up your box today, okay? We're well, almost everybody's there. It's like rounding up cats. <laughs> well, we're well into our series on relationship goals, and I'd like to begin today by asking a question with a show of hands. How many of you could use some discouragement today? Anybody? Any takers? I didn't think there would be. I mean, there's enough discouragement going around already. Critical words, complaining words. What we need actually is quite the opposite. We need encouragement we need encouraging words, don't we? Well, today we're going to talk about how we can be an encourager to every person in our lives and how that can lead to healthier and happier relationships. So I would like to encourage you to pull out your you know, outline in your worship bulletin and fill in some blanks as we go along in the message this morning. Before we do, let's ask God to bless our time together. Thank you so much, Father, for your your blessings and your mercy. We thank you for uh, the funeral yesterday as, as Jim uh, has entered glory. And we thank you for the wedding yesterday for Cameron and Madison and as they start their new life together and what a wonderful time that was as well. And we pray as we're talking about relationships today we, that you continue to, to challenge us, uh, to, to heal us, to help us become uh, better encouragers in our relationships with everyone, especially those in our family. And we ask this prayer, Father, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, 
Amen. Long before the Wright brothers, there was this young man who desired to fly. He would look into the sky and he'd watch the birds and, and as they spread their wings and soared, he thought, I think I can do that. So Elmer made some makeshift wings with feathers. He climbed a tall building in his town, extended his wings and jumped. And amazingly, he floated over the buildings. People looked up in awe at the flying Elmer. But soon, within seconds, he fell to the ground. He, he survived, but he was greatly embarrassed. He became the butt of the town's people's jokes. Elmer never recovered from the embarrassment. He hung up his wings for good, and he never tried to fly again. You know, it's always sad when a person's dreams fail, but it's especially sad when people fail another person. If you look in the Bible, you'll see that we are called to be people who nourish the dreams of others. That we are intended to be a people who take the fallen flyer and encourage them to fly again. That we are to be people of encouragement in our relationships in a very discouraging world. That's the message behind this verse in Hebrews 3, verse 13. Encourage each other every day while it is today. In other words, make encouragement your priority in your relationships. The New Testament word that is most commonly used for this word encouragement is the Greek word parakalo. It's really a compound word, para meaning to come alongside of, and kalo, which means to call. So the idea is a person comes alongside another person and they call out the good in that person. Our English word is easier to work with. Encouragement simply means to instill courage or to pour courage into another person. So if you are an encourager, you look for the Elmers of this world and you instill courage in those where courage is disappeared. Now, we probably don't have any Elmers here today who want to take flight, <laughs> but I bet there's somebody here either online or in this auditorium who needs some encouragement. Maybe it's a young family who's struggling to make it from paycheck to paycheck, and they need some encouragement. Or maybe it's a teenager who feels like they don't fit in at school, or a mom and dad who just feel overwhelmed with parenting. Maybe you're a, a leader that doesn't feel appreciated, or a retiree who just, after retirement, just kind of feel useless and worthless. We have people in our lives who need encouragement, don't we? And if we desire to have healthier relationships, then we will master the art of encouraging each other. And when we do, we'll be in fine company because, and if you have your outline out, here's your first point, because encouragement is a prime occupation of heaven. Encouragement is a prime occupation of heaven. There is a lot of encouragement that comes to us from heaven. The Bible tells us the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible, the Scriptures, all work together to encourage us. For example, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the, to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all encouragement. God is the Father of encouragement. 
Did you know that Jesus encourages us? And speaking to those in Thessalonica, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 16 through 17, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ encourages your hearts and strengthens you in every good thing you do and say. Right now, at this very moment, Jesus is encouraging you in your life. The Holy Spirit encourages us. In John 14, verse 16, Jesus said, like everybody else, I got a tickle. <coughs> you want to finish this for me for a moment? you show you where I got. <laughs> I'm right here. Jesus. Jesus, okay. Thank you. <coughs> Jesus encourages us. In speaking to those in Thessalonica, Paul said in 2 Thessal Thessalonians, the, second, the 16th through the 17th verses, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ encourages your hearts and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. Jesus is encouraging you in life. Also, the Holy Spirit encourages us. In John 14, 16, John said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Jesus uses the word paraclete to describe the Holy Spirit. It comes from the same Greek word we look at before, parakaleo. And whereas it is normally translated as the comforter or the counselor, it could just as easily be rendered as the encourager. Whenever we look at encouragement, God comes to us to encourage, to lift up, to strengthen, and he encourages. The Bible encourages us. Paul says in Romans 15.4, the scriptures were written to teach and encourage us by giving us hope. Christ brings hope into our lives. Christ came as the ultimate redeemer. Bottom line, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the scriptures are all concerned about encouraging you. And God wants us to use you and me as part of that encouragement process. So how can we encourage each other? Well, let's look at our second point. We encourage one another deliberately. Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage each other every day. And we're not talking about a casual happenstance thing, but we're talking about a premeditated, carefully planned out way we can encourage someone. I saw an example of this many years ago at a church. I served as an associate pastor in Medford, New Jersey. We had this person who was one of our elders on our leadership team who every month, who every month, every month, showed leadership. They would call or come by every person and call on our church staff and tell them how much they were appreciated and how valuable they were to the ministry 
of the church. There was no one left out, and there was not a month that went by that he didn't encourage us. He didn't lift us up. And I got to tell you, that left such an impression on me. We all need encouragement. We all need lifting up. We all need strengthening. Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager and The One Minute Father, encourages dads to be active encouragers in the home. He says, just walk around the house and try to catch your kids doing something good and make a big deal out of it. A founder of a well-known company was asked, what was the most important management skill that he learned in developing his business? His response had nothing to do with finances or budgets or setting goals. Instead, he replied, the most important management skill I learned was to be a cheerleader. We need cheerleaders, don't we? We need those who encourage us, who press us to go the extra mile. Barnabas was a cheerleader. Remember him in the book of Acts? We learn about him in Acts 4, the 36th verse. There was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was so well known for his encouragement that he became known as Mr. Encourager. And no one was more appreciative of his ability to encourage than that newcomer to the church that no one wanted to have anything to do with. And you couldn't fault them. I mean, the guy was a murderer. Not only that, but he was also a murderer of Christians. But when Saul, who later became known as Paul, came to the church, Barnabas became his friend. And Barnabas defended him. We're told about it in Acts 9.27. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and described how Saul had seen the Lord, who spoke to him on the road to Damascus, and how Saul had spoken boldly in that city in the name of Jesus. Barnabas was a defender and an encourager. We wonder what would have happened if Barnabas had stayed quiet. Also, through the encouragement of Barnabas, Mark was given a second chance after his failure. Look at Acts 15, 39. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. How many people stop because so few people say go? How many people quit flying because so few say, try again, give it another shot? Every life needs a Barnabas, and every life benefits from encouragement. And boy, could we ever use some Barnabas today, right? Especially today where people are so critical, where people are just beaten down day after day by criticism, by those words that are spoken that have an edge, that do damage, that leave scars. We need moms and dads to be a Barnabas for their kids. We, we husbands to be a Barnabas for our wives. And wives be a Barnabas for their husbands. 
We need employers to be a Barnabas for their employees. And yes, even employees to be a Barnabas for their employers. Can you imagine what a difference it would make in our world if more people took seriously the command to encourage one another? Because encouragement has a way of empowering and inspiring us to accept challenges that we might otherwise think impossible. So encourage each other deliberately. And then thirdly, we encourage one another urgently. Hebrews 3.13, encourage each other every day while it is today. This is an urgent plea to encourage someone today. Not tomorrow, but today. Why? Why do we need to encourage each other every day? Because we don't know what tomorrow might bring. Elsewhere in the Bible, we see that we shouldn't put off to tomorrow what can be done today. The psalmist writes in Psalms 118, the 24th verse, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. There is no better time to encourage someone than at this moment, right now. Not tomorrow, but now. Because you never know what the word of encouragement might mean to that person at that very moment. I have a pastor friend named Bob Shin, who told me a story about a time when he almost delayed encouragement. He said, there was a young man in his congregation who had been coming to his church for several weeks. He sat in the back of the church and often he would slip out before speaking to anyone. But one Sunday, Bob said, he felt the nudging of the Holy Spirit to just say something to the young man. He said, Roland, I almost didn't do it. I thought, well, how am I going to get to the back before he leaves? But then I came up with an idea. I decided to close the service from the back of the auditorium rather than the front. That way I could catch him before he left. It worked. Bob reached out his hand and told the young man, I appreciate you being here each week. I notice that you are really listening. I would like to take you out to breakfast tomorrow morning. What do you say? The young man paused for a moment and agreed. Sure enough, the next morning he showed up for breakfast. Bob asked him what he did for a living or did he go to school? The young man only spoke with one or two words. He didn't say much. There was a long pause and as he looked downward he said, I don't have any friends. What about your family? Bob asked. I have no family. I live alone. If I disappeared tomorrow, no one would care or notice. I came to church yesterday trying to decide what to do. I had decided I was going to end it all. Until. Until, Bob said. I was so nervous. Bob said, I knew that I needed to choose my words carefully because this boy's life hung in the balance. Until, the young man said, you talk to me 
and invited me to breakfast. We never know when someone needs encouragement, do we? We never know what they're dealing with in their life. We never know what challenges lay before them. The wise man was correct when he wrote in Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So how can you be an encourager this week? Well, I want to give you two ideas to take home with you. Practice specific praise. There's a passage in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 24th verse. And it goes like this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love. Consider is to think about or to plan the praise that you're going to give to someone. To give specific praise is to, to think ahead of time what you were going to praise somebody about. I remember this older woman in a church that I served in Kansas. She had this way of getting your attention when she wanted to say something to you. She was not very tall, but I remember on one occasion she reached up to me, grabbed my face, and said, I want you to know I appreciate you. I love what you're doing. And then she did the same with Brenda. She placed her hands on her face and said, I appreciate you. Thank you for all of your hard work. I don't know how, to, how you put up with Roland. That's unfair, he's not here. No, she didn't say the latter, but she gave us specific praise. Try this. Go up to someone or call them on the phone and say, can you give me 120 seconds for me to tell you what a great person you are? They're going to be blown away. And then you just let it fly. Oh, you've always been such a good friend. You've always shown up at the baseball game. Thanks for the way you... You're going to have so much fun, you'll want to do that all day long. Practice specific praise. Parents... Your children are hungry for praise. They come home thirsty just dry from, from being a middle schooler or a high schooler. They need a word of prayer, of, of praise from you. Fill them with praise. And then lastly, celebrate generously. Find something to celebrate. Celebrate every good grade. Celebrate every finished report. Celebrate every cooked meal. Celebrate everything with others. Be a source of encouragement to all. The Apostle Paul said this in Acts 20.20. 20. I didn't skimp or trim in any way. Every truth and encouragement that could have made a difference to you, you got. Come alongside and bring the best out of someone. And when you do, you'll be doing the work of encouragement in your relationships. You'll be doing the very work of God. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word of encouragement in our lives. Lord, open our eyes to those around us. Father, touch our hearts that we would feel, we would understand 
we would sense when those around us are in need of encouragement. And Lord, we pray that our compassion, our joy would show through to them. Might our words lift up the lives of others. Might we encourage others and bring hope in all circumstances to those around you. Father God, guide our lives that we might be your hands and be your feet in this world. In Christ's holy name, amen. Let's all stand together now and sing hymn number 450, Lord Speak to Me. Thank you so much, Rick. I didn't realize that's going to go to the bullpen in the second inning, but <laughs> by the way, that was a really good sermon. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. And I do apologize, uh, you know, how those coughing things happen and they get going and, and, and they letting things. I do apologize to you, but thank you, Rick, so much. And you may go in the name of God, the Father, the Almighty, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who is with us both now and for all eternity. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you. 